Brought to you by Yoda. This episode of the Sooty Penguin is Want a headache, do you? Hmm? Listen to Yoda today. In an apparently unprecedented move, Southern California officials declared a water shortage emergency last week and ordered outdoor water usage be restricted to just one day a week for about 6 million people in parts of Los Angeles, Ventura, and San Bernardino counties. Does SoCal have a really concerning water shortage? Absolutely. But, and I say this as someone currently living in SoCal, are we being a little naive when we use the word emergency? Good Wednesday morning, I'm Ethan Brown, and this is Tip of the Iceberg, where I will break down some environmental news and then answer a question from our listeners on the air. Submit questions via Patreon, email, or social media. Patron questions go to the front of the line, so sign up at patreon.com slash thesweatypenguin. The Sweaty Penguin is presented by Paraland Promise, a public media initiative from the WNET Group in New York reporting on the issues and solutions around climate change. You can learn more at pbs.org slash Promise. I don't think I've broken this down on the podcast before, so let's do a quick weather crash course. You can't see me, so I'll totally pretend I'm wearing a lightning tie. Our atmosphere contains a whole bunch of shells. The stratosphere, the mesosphere, turtle, snail, conch, gas station, etc. But the shell we care about, the smallest shell that contains all our weather, is called the troposphere. I'm sure you've heard before that warm air rises, or felt it in the summer if your room is upstairs. So if we go to the equator where the air is the warmest, That air rises, and it keeps rising until it reaches the top of the troposphere. That's about 36,000 feet up, about where Yao Ming's belly button is. Once that air gets as high as it can go, it starts to spread out. It moves north, and it moves south. And as it goes, it starts to cool off. What does that mean? The air starts sinking. So what we see is at latitudes of about 30 degrees north and 30 degrees south, that air is now traveling down. By the time it reaches the surface of the Earth, the same thing happens where it dissipates again. Some air goes north, some air goes south, and returns to the equator where the cycle repeats. These cycles of air rising at the equator moving north and south 30 degrees, and then sinking, are called Hadley cells. And George Hadley's mom must be so proud that that's the thing he got named after him. What does that mean for rain? Remember our water cycle from elementary school, evaporation, condensation, precipitation. If you remember anything from elementary school, it's that, the three branches of government, and when Tanner H. threw up on his desk. Anyway, when air is sinking, it creates an area of high pressure. The air is pushing down on everything else. That means water vapor isn't going to rise up as easily. And as a result, it won't condense. It won't turn into clouds. Maybe the water vapor gets nervous. Who knows? It might want to talk to its therapist. Whereas where air is rising by the equator, it creates an area of of low pressure. There's plenty of room for water vapor to rise up, condense, and come back down as rain. Obviously, it's not quite that simple, but that's the basic theory. And if you think about it, the equator travels through the Amazon rainforest in South America, the Congo rainforest in Africa, and the rainforest of Indonesia, all areas of heavy rain. Whereas at 30 degrees north, You have the Sahara Desert, you have the Middle East, you have SoCal, you have all these notoriously dry regions. I assume dining hall chicken breast comes from 30 degrees north, too. 
Again, it's not quite that simple. There's many exceptions to the rule. But this is sort of the baseline reason for why it is dry in Southern California. Add in climate change, and SoCal gets even drier. The warmer temperatures lead to more water evaporating, be it from lakes, rivers, or even directly from the soil. In a low-pressure system like the Amazon rainforest, that will rain back down. But in SoCal, a high-pressure system, it won't. It'll complain about the taxes and move. Now that the ground has dried up, it will also heat up faster, and the issue starts to snowball. Or dirt ball. Tumbleweed? Metal Sonic with the speed boost? Eh, I'll work on it. And speaking of snowballs, on top of that, the source of a lot of water in SoCal is the snowpacks in the Sierra Nevada. Normally, those should melt in the summer, provide a decent flow of water, and then replenish from winter snow. Now that it's warmer, the snowpacks melt in the spring, leaving nothing left for the summer. And in the winter, there's a lot less snow to replenish. A lot of it comes as rain and just runs off into the Pacific Ocean. Why do I say all that? Well, it's very clear just off that little crash course that the water shortage in SoCal is not going away. It is natural to the climate, and while we may be fortunate enough to see fluctuations, the region is only getting drier in the coming years. It's like that piece of bread sitting in the back of your pantry, or Aubrey Plaza's humor in every interview. The LA Times did an editorial last year titled, There Is No Drought, and I was taken aback by the headline at first, but it's actually a really good point. If you Google the definition of drought, and you bypass the Urban Dictionary definition, the definition you'll find is, quote, a prolonged period of abnormally low rainfall leading to a shortage of water. Notice the key word there, abnormally low rainfall. So if we're talking on the timescale of decades or centuries, sure, climate change is causing abnormally low rainfall in SoCal. But if we're talking about this year, and we say, oh, we've got a drought this year, we have an emergency. I don't know, it's not incorrect. But doesn't that make it sound like there's better times ahead? That if we get through the emergency, there's endless hot tubs and water parks on the other side? I really don't say that to be a downer. I say it because when we talk about climate adaptation, it's so much cheaper, safer, and often more equitable to be strategic than to be reactionary. We have officials saying, oh no, there's an emergency, quick, we gotta conserve water. That's fine, but by that logic, when won't it be an emergency? That's really stressful to be cobbling together restrictive policies after feigning surprise that, oh, it's dry again. Isn't it less stressful to say, all right, this is how much water we have now, let's plan accordingly. It's the same thing when you're on a lifeboat. If you freak out and drink those five cans of water right away and don't plan for 227 days at sea, you and that tiger are going to be screwed and you could end up on a carnivorous island with a bunch of meerkats for some reason. So if you don't do that and you plan, you can avoid a lot of the frustrating emergency restrictions and create outcomes to actually be excited about rather than create a book that my sixth grade teacher recommended to me because, quote, I like math. That's a true story. She saw the title Life of Pi and assumed it was about trigonometry or something. What does that advanced planning look like? There's plenty of options. There are some more ambitious technological ideas, such as desalination and water pipelines to increase the water supply, but that's really complicated, so I won't get into that. But there are some less overwhelming strategies for conserving water. California has the largest agriculture sector of any state in the U.S., and the two leading commodities are dairy and almonds, both notoriously high users of water. Does that mean ban dairy and almonds and demand everyone only drink oat milk? 
Well, in LA, they wouldn't even notice, but for everyone else, no. These industries have so many ways they could conserve water, and I hate to bring it up myself because they're taking steps already. They're really on the cutting edge. That's like me telling Katie Ledecky how to swim, or Tom Cruise how to get divorced. On dairy farms, for example, the cooperative Dairy Cares says it's standard practice on California farms to use clean water to refrigerate the milk, recycle that water and use it to wash and cool cows, capture that water and clean the barn floors with it, and then finally use it to irrigate feed crops in surrounding fields. So that's awesome. Kind of makes me want to hose down some cows before cleaning my apartment. And they can keep building. There's options like drip irrigation, alternative feeds that don't use as much water, and creating more efficient cow washing systems that use less water. They can also continue finding ways to improve on fertilizer and pesticide use, which as we discussed on Friday in the stormwater episode, make sure any runoff isn't ridiculously polluted, which means the rest of the state can then use that water. And we can do the same mental exercise with almonds. These practices that save on water, save on fertilizer, save on pesticides, also save money. They may cost more to get going, but that's where the government can say, hey, what do you need? What can we do to get this done? Right now, farmers are really frustrated by a lot of the more knee-jerk regulations and see them as an economic burden. Flipping the script and finding ways to save water, save money, and make everyone happy is a lot more exciting. At the same time, the government can think about future planning and consider how any new agriculture in the state could be less water intensive than dairy or almonds. We can do the same thing when we talk about urban areas. There's a lot of talk about ripping out lawns or letting them go brown, and in some cases that may help, even if it gives dads everywhere a heart attack. I mean, what will their sons mow now to learn a hard day's work? Machine Gun Kelly's hair? But when we talk about ripping out lawns, what are you replacing them with? Well-managed plant life has a cooling effect on the nearby climate, absorbs and stores carbon, has demonstrated mental and physical health benefits on surrounding communities, and helps store and clean stormwater. If you start using fake grass or gravel, you lose a lot of benefits, and on a summer day, your shoes catch fire the second you step on it. So maybe think about less water-intensive grasses or other plants or trees that can provide shade and prevent some of the water from evaporating. Certainly it's worth being a bit strategic here. Even at the individual household, it's a similar conversation. It's a bit old, but a 2015 field poll found the vast majority of Californians think the drought is a serious problem, but 44% said it would be hard for them personally to make more of a sacrifice. Psychologists have found, in large part, the issue is that people feel their individual action won't make a dent in the problem. And in isolation, yes, that's true. I often criticize proposals along the lines of, if everyone would just blah blah blah, because that just doesn't happen in the real world. But there are ways to get around that dilemma. For example, some agencies tried showing people how their water usage stacked up to their neighbors, and saw people saved water as a result. If you know everyone else is doing it, you'll do it too. I wonder what would happen if we sent everyone pictures of their neighbors jumping off a bridge. You can also educate people on things they can do to conserve water, create incentives for reducing your water use, anything to make it a social norm rather than a regulation. Again, you can use regulations if you want. That's an option. It certainly yields quicker results. But won't people get frustrated by regulations really fast? Isn't it an easier pill to swallow to collectively say, hey, Let's all be creative and save some money together by conserving water, as opposed to banning uses of water left and right. I'm sure SoCal wouldn't have slapped on regulations last week if it weren't necessary, but going forward, it may be worth reframing the problem. Like I said, I'm in SoCal right now. I'm not in the counties that just got this regulation, but I'm in Orange County, which is very close by. 
I have yet to feel any sort of social incentive to save water. And I'm pretty sure my apartment complex evenly splits up its total water bill across every apartment rather than billing each apartment for the water they use. So I don't get to save money if I save water either. That's odd to me. I call it the annoying group of friends at a restaurant method. Look, there's so many ways to make climate adaptation really exciting, but it has to be strategic. It has to acknowledge the future, not pretend there's an emergency that will tough our way through and pop out the other side. And if we did embrace that, maybe it's a tough reality at first, but certainly I'd much prefer that than Marshall Oat Milk Law. Like being confused, do you? Mm -hmm. For you, then Yoda is. No, if Yoda thinks about the environment, I do not. But a green thumb, he has. Yoda, broken my brain, is. The Sweaty Penguin is presented by Peril and Promise, a public media initiative from the WNET Group in New York, reporting on the issues and solutions around climate change. You can learn more at pbs.org slash perilandpromise. Welcome back to Tip of the Iceberg. It's time for Ask Me Anything, where our listeners get a chance to ask me any environmental questions they may have. Submit questions on our Patreon, email, or social media. Questions from patrons go to the front of the line, so be sure to sign up today at patreon.com slash the sweaty penguin. Today's Ask Me Anything comes from Maureen Shea, who asks... I understand climate change as a problem, however, I would like to know how we alone, without China or India or Russia or Australia, will make a difference. It just doesn't seem possible unless the wind stops blowing. I have read that the difference will be infinitesimal. Thanks for the question, Maureen. Very important one because you are right. Just like one individual can't address the water shortage alone, one country can't address climate change alone. It does take a collective global effort. But this is a catch-22, because if you listen to what leaders in China, India, Russia, and Australia say, it's, why should we do anything if the US doesn't? It's the same thing. And that's where global governance comes into play. There's no global enforcement mechanism, but you can get together with countries and create treaties. If someone breaks a treaty, you can't put them in jail, but you can use economic sanctions. You can voice your displeasure on the global stage. There's things you can do to incentivize people to follow through. I recommend scrolling back to episode 30 of The Sweaty Penguin on international accountability, which we did last year, which explores a lot of the challenges with holding countries accountable. But ultimately, it is possible. The Montreal Protocol is a great example where countries agreed to eliminate ozone-depleting gases and very impressively got the job done. Let me offer a more hopeful take, though. We talked a few weeks ago about the recent report from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Among the findings in the report, in the last decade, The cost of photovoltaic solar dropped by 85%, the cost of onshore wind dropped by 55%, and the cost of batteries for electric vehicles dropped by 85%, often making these energy sources cheaper than fossil fuel alternatives. On top of that, their analysis of 38 climate solutions found that 16, including the aforementioned ones, start out saving people money and another 13% cost less than $20 for every ton of CO2 cut. That means we could implement these solutions such as solar, wind, and batteries and save money, grow our economy, outcompete other countries in the energy sector. If they want to follow suit, awesome. But if not, we're the ones that end up with a leg up. Same thing if you look at other issues, health, hunger, peace, social justice, etc. These climate solutions, a vast majority of the time, help with these issues too. So why not do them? 
I don't mean to read too much into your question, Maureen, but you hit on such an important thing. We act like climate action is a chore, and it isn't. Most of the time, climate action is about being efficient, being smart, being strategic, and that also saves you money. If other countries aren't convinced of that for whatever reason, why not be the role model who shows the world how awesome it is to mitigate greenhouse gas emissions? You might not mitigate global climate change completely, but you'll make a dent, and you'll certainly get everyone else in the world's attention. So it's good to hold other countries accountable, absolutely. But I wouldn't use other countries as a benchmark for whether or not we should take a specific action. Climate solutions done well bring way more benefits than costs, and regardless of what other countries do, we're wealthier, healthier, and otherwise better off if we do our part. Thanks so much for the question, Maureen, and thanks to all of you who listened to Tip of the Iceberg. Take two minutes, help out the show, and get a shout-out at the end of the show by leaving a five-star rating and a review on Apple or Podcast Addict, or join our Patreon at patreon.com slash thesweatypenguin. You get merch, bonus content, and your question moved to the front of the line for Tip of the Iceberg. The Sweaty Penguin is presented by Peril and Promise, a public media initiative from the WNET Group in New York, reporting on the issues and solutions around climate change. You can learn more at pbs.org slash perilandpromise. The opinions expressed in this podcast are those of the host and guests. They do not necessarily reflect the opinions or views of Peril and Promise or the WNET Group. Thank you all for listening, and I'll see you on Friday for a deep dive on El Yunque National Forest. Rest.